Monarchs, Milkweed, and Michael Behe. The appearance of design in nature is overwhelming. I'm sure most of you have seen this quote, biology is the study of complicated things that have the purpose of uh, have the appearance of having been designed with a purpose. Uh, some of you may recognize the author. His name is Richard Dawkins. That is found in The Blind Watchmaker. I'm going to go a little further into that um, passage. Starting the paragraph before, complicated things everywhere deserve a very special kind of explanation. We want to know how they came into existence and why they are so complicated. The explanation, as I shall argue, is likely to be broadly the same for complicated things everywhere in the universe, the same for us, for chimpanzees, worms, oak trees, and monsters from outer space. On the other hand, it will not be the same for what I call simple things, such as rocks, clouds, rivers, galaxies, and quarks. Galaxies are simple? Well, uh, that raises an interesting... Uh, it goes on to say that those are describable by physics. The difference is one of complexity of design. Now remember, this is Richard Dawkins, and he is giving you this story. And if you close your eyes, you can almost imagine an intelligent design theorist. Um, <clears throat> biology is a study of complicated things that give the appearance of having been designed for a purpose. That's our original quote. Physics is a study of simple things that do not tempt us to invoke design. At first sight, man-made artifacts like computers and cars will seem to provide exceptions. They are complicated and obviously designed for a purpose, yet they are not alive, and they are made of metal and plastic rather than of flesh and blood. In this book, they will be firmly treated as biological objects. Wait a minute. The reader's reaction to this may be to ask, yes, but are they really biological objects? Words are our servants, not our masters. For different purposes, we find it convenient to use words in different senses. Most cookery book class, uh, mo most cookery books class lobsters as fish. Zoologists can become quite apoplectic about this, pointing out that lobsters could, with greater justice, call humans fish, since fish are far closer akin to humans than they are to lobsters. And again, and talking of justice and lobsters, I understand that a court of law recently had to decide whether lobsters were insects or animals. It bore upon whether people should be allowed to boil them alive. Zoologically speaking, lobsters are certainly not insects. They are animals, but then so are insects, and so are we. There is little point in getting worked up about the way different people use words, although in my non-professional life, I'm quite prepared to get worked up about people who boil lobsters alive. Cooks and lawyers need to use words in their own special ways, and so do I in this book. Never mind whether cars and computers are really biological objects. The point is that if anything of that degree of complexity were found on a planet, we should have no hesitation in concluding that life existed or had once existed on that planet. Machines are the direct products of living objects. They derive their complexity and design from living objects, and they are diagnostic of the existence of life on a planet. The same goes for fossils, skeletons, and dead bodies. Now... I'm going to point out that he's not quite correct. There are things on the moon right now, um, uh, some of which were planted by humans, but some of which were not planted by humans. Uh, they were sent up there uh, by remote control. Uh, Venus has some uh, contraptions sitting on the surface that... Uh, and the humans have not been to Venus, but humans did send those. Um, and the final thing I want to say is that it's not just life, it's intelligent life. That is to say, uh, they're evidence of design. But as you will see, Dawkins actually won't argue very strongly against that presupposition. I said that physics is a study of simple things, and this too may seem strange at first. Galaxy aren't complicated? Physics books may be complicated, but physics books, like cars and computers, are the product of biological objects, human brains. So, see, he does recognize 
that intelligent design does these things. Uh, so what is a complex thing? How should we recognize it? In what sense is it true to say that a watch or an airliner or an earwig or a person is complex, but the moon is simple? The first point that might occur to us as a necessary attribute of a complex thing is that it has a heterogeneous structure. A pink milk pudding or blank mange is simple in the sense that if we slice it in two, the two portions will have the same internal constitution. A blank mange is homogeneous. A car is heterogeneous. You slice it in two and the two halves don't match. And if you slice it front to back, the two halves definitely don't match. Such heterogeneity or many-partedness may be a necessary condition, but it is not sufficient. Plenty of objects are many-parted when heterogeneous in internal structure, without being complex in the sense in which I want to use the term. Mont Blanc, for example, consists of many different kinds of rock all jumbled together. Let us try another tack in our quest for a definition of complexity and make use of the mathematical idea of probability. Suppose we try out the following definition. A complex thing is something whose constituent parts are arranged in a way that is unlikely to have arisen by chance alone. To borrow an analogy from an eminent astronomer, <coughs> oil, um, if you take the parts of an airliner and jumble them up at random, the likelihood that you will would happen to assemble a working Boeing is vanishingly small. Notice he's conceding this point. Um, I, this approach to a definition of complexity is promising, but something more is still needed. There are billions of ways to throwing together the bits of Mont Blanc, it might be said, and only one of them is Mont Blanc. So what is it that makes the airliner and the human complicated if Mont Blanc is simple? Any old jumbled collection of parts is unique and with hindsight is as improbable as any other. So why don't we say that a rubbish dump or Mont Blanc or the moon is just as complex as an airplane or a dog because in all these cases the arrangement of atoms is improbable. The combination lock on my bicycle has 4,096 different positions. Every one of these is equally improbable in the sense that if you spin the wheels at random, Every one of the 4,096 positions is equally unlikely to turn up. I can spin the wheels at random, look at whatever number is displayed, and exclaim with hindsight, how amazing the odds against that number appearing are 1 in uh, 4,096 to 1. A minor miracle. That is equivalent to regarding the particular arrangement of rocks in a mountain or bits of metal in a scrap heap as complex. But one of those 4,096 wheel positions really is interestingly unique. The combination 1207, I hope he's changed that by now, <laughs> is the only one that opens the lock. The uniqueness of 1207 has nothing to do with hindsight. It is specified in advance by the manufacturer. If you spun the wheels at random and happened to hit 1207 first time, you would be able to steal the bike and it would seem a minor miracle. If you struck lucky on one of those multi-dialed combination locks on bank safes, it would seem like a very major miracle, for the odds against it are many millions to one, and you would be able to steal a fortune. Have you s heard arguments like this before? I have. Uh, from Dembski. Now, hitting upon the lucky number that opens the bank safe is the equivalent in our analogy of hurling scrap metal around at random and happening to assemble a Boeing 747. Of all the millions of unique and, with hindsight, equally improbable positions of the combination lock, only one opens the lock. Similarly, of all the millions of unique and, with hindsight, equally improbable arrangements of a heap of junk, only one, or very few, will fly. The uniqueness of the arrangement that flies or that opens the safe is nothing to do with hindsight. It is specified in advance. Does the term specified complexity ring any bells? Well, specified complexity, of course, is uh, a Dembski standard. And then Michael Behe came along and challenged where Dawkins is going by saying that there are some things evolution can't do and they occur in nature. So Michael Behe wrote Darwin's Black Box and points out 
the concept of irreducible complexity. This is the idea that you have to have all six parts or all 250,000 parts in some cases, or perhaps you have to have 249,537, and then you get to play with the other 400 and whatever it is parts in order to make the thing work. And that while there may be a gradation at the very top, until you get there, there is no selective pressure. And in fact, there is deselective pressure because you're keeping all of that DNA for no particular reason. In the edge of evolution, he talks about how much um, evolution can do. And in fact, we all know there is an edge to evolution. Everybody, if it's put this way, admits it. If you put in a Petri dish and it has E. coli in it, and you come back the next morning and you find a cockroach there, your first hypothesis is not that the cockroach evolved from the E. coli overnight. So, well, how much time does it take for E. coli to produce a cockroach? Uh, so there is an edge to evolution. There is a point at which evolution cannot be expected to go. And in fact, in this talk, we're going to explore that edge in a very interesting way. Uh, evolution does have an edge. It is surprisingly small, and it is smaller than what is necessary to explain life on Earth. That is Behe's message. Behe wrote another book, or pardon me, another, actually this is an article called Experimental Evolution, Loss of Function, Mutations, and the First Rule of Adaptive Evolution in the Quarterly Review of Biology, and you can get it online if you want to read it. And in it, he talks about the first rule of adaptive evolution, which is break or blunt any functional coded element whose loss would yield a net fitness gain. Now, I'm going to go through a little bit about Darwin devolves. We've been through it some already, but I'm going to try to point out something very special at the end, and then we're going to dive into some fascinating research. Uh, the polar bear's most strongly selective mutations, and thus the most important for its survival, occurred in a gene dubbed APOB, which is involved in fat metabolism in mammals, including humans. That itself is not surprising, since the diet of polar bears contains a very large proportion of fat, much higher than, that, than in the diet of brown bears, from seal blubber, so we might expect metabolic changes were needed to accommodate it. But what precisely did the changes in polar bear APOB do to it compared to that of other animals? When the same gene is mutated in humans or mice, that he showed it frequently leads to high levels of cholesterol and heart disease. The scientists who study the polar bear's genome detected multiple mutations in APOB. Since few experiments can be done with grumpy polar bears, and they take a long time too, um, they analyzed the changes by computer. They determined that the mutations were very likely to be damaging, that is, likely to degrade or destroy the function of the protein that the gene codes for. A second highly selected gene list is associated with pigmentation, and the changes in it are probably responsible for the blanching of the ancestor's brown fur. Computer analysis of the multiple mutations of the gene show that they, too, were almost certainly damaging to its function. In fact, of all the mutations in the 17 genes that were most highly selected, about half were protected to damage the function of the respected coded proteins. So there's actually 17 genes that they're mentioning, they just, or that they're yeah, mentioning, not necessarily documenting exactly where they come from. Uh, furthermore, since most altered genes bore several mutations, only three to six, depending on the method of estimation, out of 17 genes were free of degrading changes. Put differently, 65 to 83 percent of helpful, positively selected genes are estimated to have suffered at least one damaging mutation. So what you're seeing is devolution. That's why the title of the book, Darwin Devolves. It seems then that the magnificent Ursus Maritimus has 
adjusted to its harsh environment mainly by degrading genes that its ancestors already possessed. Despite its impressive abilities, rather than it evolving, it has adapted predominantly by devolving. What that portends for our conception of evolution is the principal topic of this book. Now, I'm going to stop here and ask what is a devolutionary change? Well, obviously, the omission of useful genetic material is a devolutionary change. Probably almost as obviously, the putting in of a mutation which destroys the function of that information is a devolutionary change. Arguably, the addition of nonsense genetic material is devolution because the creature is not quite as fit as it was before. It has to make some extra, not much, but it has to make extra DNA that costs it something in terms of uh, living. Now, obviously the addition of useful material is actually positive evolution. That's going upward. Okay. Um, what about changes in genetic material? Well, here we get into a difficult situation. So we'll, we'll discuss some of this. Changes that give a new function without degrading the original function would be, in fact, positive evolution. Or improve a function that uh, was there already, I think would also be positive evolution. That would not be devolution. Changes that degrade an old function but give a new function, depending on the worth of the old function and the worth of the new function, could be viewed as devolutionary. The best example I can give, uh, and Behe actually doesn't, or, or waffles on this point, is a change from, I think it's alanine to valine in... Uh, in human hemoglobin at a precise point will allow the, the uh, red cells to sickle if low enough oxygen is present, if it's heterozygous. If it's homozygous, it sickles spontaneously, and that's what gives sickle cell anemia. Um, is that Evolution or devolution? Well, if you're in an area with malaria, it's advantageous because if the uh, hemoglobin will sickle when uh, oxygen drops so low, maybe it will sickle in the presence of plasmodium, uh, uh, plasmodia. And if that happens, then uh, it presumably kills the organisms and, uh, and then uh, the person does not get malaria. Um, at least that's probably the, the most prominent theory out right now. Um, but of course what it means is that one quarter of your kids will get sickle cell anemia and they will die. And probably without leaving any offspring and certainly miserably. And um, in that case, uh, that seems like a rather severe disadvantage to have and only worthwhile if malaria is killing everybody else. Uh, so I would argue that that's actually devolutionary. Changes that degrade an old function but prevent uh, an old susceptibility are, are more arguably devolutionary. That is, they degrade an old function but they protect you from some noxious presence out there. Um, the ideal organism wouldn't have to deal with that kind of a problem, and so therefore uh, you don't have to uh, uh, the function is not as good. And, and one example that could be given is uh, certain antibiotics will glom onto the ribosome that makes proteins for bacteria. Our ribosomes are structured differently, and so they don't affect us in the same way, or certainly at least to the same degree. And uh, 
so you can kill bacteria with those kinds of antibiotics. Well, if you tweak the ribosome a little bit, you can make it so that the tetracycline or whatever it is doesn't stick. Or maybe it sticks, but it doesn't uh, ruin the uh, operation of the uh, ribosome. Um, and bacteria do that, and they become resistant to, let's say, tetracycline. In fact, there are some bacteria that need tetracycline in their structure in order to work, because if it is not there, then they can't make protein. And those are nice bacteria to have because they can't escape from the laboratory, because if they get out, they die. But, but that, from a from an experiential point is evolution, it's change, but from a, an information standpoint, that's degrading information. And all you have to do is let the two or sets of organisms out into the wild and the wild type will outcompete the mutated type. So we come to uh, something that is just from this month. CRISPR fruit flies mimic monarch butterfly and could make you vomit. Scientists recreate in flies the mutations that let monarch butterfly eat toxic milkweed with impunity. I assume that, that uh, they didn't mind have, having the, the English not quite so smooth. This, um, this is, uh, the date is October 2, 2019. And everything now has an abstract, so even this news article has an abstract. They call it a summary. Uh, monarch butterflies and a few other insects evolved essentially the same genetic mutations, allowing them to eat toxic milkweed without getting sick. Monarch butterflies and caterpillars store the toxins to deter predators. Scientists have now used CRISPR gene editing to make these same mutations in fruit, fruit flies, successfully t conferring toxin resistance. This is the first time an animal has been genetically engineered to eat a new food and employ a new type of deterrence. The fruit flies, this is the beginning of the actual article, the fruit flies in Noah Whiteman's lab may be hazardous to your health. Whiteman and his University of California Berkeley colleagues have turned perfectly palatable fruit flies, palatable at least to frogs and birds, I guess we're not that interested, into potentially poisonous prey that may cause anything that eats them to puke. In large enough quantities, the flies likely would make a human puke, too, much like the emetic effect of Ipecac syrup. That's because the team genetically engineered the flies using CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing to be able to eat milkweed without dying and to sequester its toxins, just as America's most beloved butterfly, the monarch, does to other predators, to deter predators. This is the first time anyone has re created in a multicellular organism a set of evolutionary mutations leading to a totally new adaptation to the environment, in this case, a new diet and a new way of deterring predators. Like monarch caterpillars, the crispered fruit fly maggots thrive on milkweed, which contains toxins that kill most other animals, humans included. The maggots store the toxins in their bodies and retain them through metamorphosis after they turn into adult flies, which means that the adult monarch flies could also make animals upchuck. See, so remember the adult monarch butterfly doesn't eat milkweed. Uh, it has to get all of that stuff from the caterpillar, which does eat milkweed. The team achieved this feat by making three CRISPR edits in a single gene modifications identical to the genetic mutations that allow monarch butterflies to dine on milkweed and sequester its poison. These mutations in the monarch have allowed it to eat common poisonous plants of other insects could not and are key to the butterfly's thriving presence throughout North and Central America. We're going to come back to that. Flies with a triple genetic mutation proved to be 1,000 times less sensitive to milkweed toxin than the wild fruit fly. As you give them enough, yes, it will kill them too. It just takes a lot. Uh, Drosophila melanogaster. Um, Whiteman and his colleagues will describe their experiment in the October 2 issue of the journal Nature. Notice that this was put out in October 2, so it's kind of a coordinated thing. Uh, yes? Just a minute. 
Uh, try that again. Uh, does does this get into uh, not just they're able to eat it without dying, but they but they would actually seek out uh, these plants and enjoy eating them? I don't know that they have taken the fruit flies and turned them out into the wild and see whether they go after milkweed or not. Um, but they will eat milkweed if you feed it to them in the laboratory. So these are genetically modified fruit flies. Ooh, GM. Um, monarch flies. The UC Berkeley researchers created these monarch flies to establish beyond a shadow of a doubt which genetic changes in the genome of monarch butterflies were necessary to allow them to eat milkweed with impunity. They found, surprisingly, that only three single nucleotide substitutions in one gene are sufficient to give fruit flies the same toxin resistance as monarchs. Three. All we did was change three sites, and we made these superflies, said Whiteman, an associate professor of integrative biology. But to me, the most amazing thing is that we were able to test evolutionary hypotheses in a way that has never been possible outside of cell lines. It would have been difficult to discover this without having the ability to create mutations with CRISPR. Um, CRISPR is basically you take some RNA, and you line it up in it, and the the enzyme finds the DNA that matches that RNA, changes one specific, uh, 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 I mean, there's a, there's a whole bunch of complicated stuff behind this, but the, they're able to change one specific base to another specific base, and then uh, you have just uh, made your uh, uh, designer genes, if I can call it that. Whiteman's team also showed that 20 other insect groups able to eat milkweed and related toxic plants, including moths, beetles, wasps, flies, aphids, a weevil, and a true bug, most of which sport the color orange to warn away predators, independently evolved mutations in one, two, or three of the same amino acid positions to overcome to varying degrees the toxic effects of these plant poisons. In fact, his team reconstructed the one, two, and three mutations that led to each of the four butterfly and moth lineages, each mutation conferring some resistance to the toxin. All three mutations were necessary to make the monarch butterfly the king of milkweed. Resistance to milkweed toxin comes at a cost, however. Monarch flies that are, are not as quick to recover from upsets, such as being shaken, a test known as bang sensitivity. They get seizures, or the insect equivalent of seizures. This shows there is a cost to mutations in terms of recovery of the nervous system and probably other things we don't know about, Whiteman said. But the benefit of being able to escape a predator is so high. If it's death or toxins, the toxins will win, even if there is a cost. Plant versus insect. Whiteman is interested in the evolutionary battle between plants and parasites and was intrigued by the evolutionary adaptations that allowed the monarch to beat the milkweed's toxic defense. He also wanted to know whether other insects that are resistant, though all less resi resistant than the monarch, monarch is the king of resistance. Uh, can I call it the monarch of resistance? Ooh. Um, use similar tricks to disable the toxin. Since plants and animals first invaded land 400 million years ago. This co-evolutionary arms race is thought to have given rise to a lot of the plant and animal diversity that we see because most animals are insects and most insects are herbivorous. They eat plants, he said. Milkweeds and a variety of other plants, including foxglove, the source of digitoxin and digoxin, contain related toxins called cardiac glycosides that can kill an elephant and any creature with a beating heart. Foxglove's effect on the heart is the reason that an extract of the plant in the genus Digitalis has been used for centuries to treat heart conditions and why digoxin and digitoxin are used today to tr treat congestive heart failure. Actually, I wasn't aware the digitoxin was used that way, but uh, we'll take a look at them. Their structure is very similar. These plants' bitterness alone is enough to deter most animals, but a small minority of insects, including the monarch, and its relative, the queen butterfly, have learned to love milkweed and use it to repel predators. Whiteman noted that the monarch is a tropical 
lineage that invaded North America after the last ice age, in part enabled by the three mutations that allowed it to eat a poisonous plant other animals could not, giving it a survival edge and a natural defense against predators. The monarch resists the toxin best of all the insects, and it has the biggest population size of any of them. It's all over the world, he said. The new paper reveals that the mutations had to occur in the right sequence, or else the flies would never have survived the three separate mutational events. Thwarting the sodium pump. The poisons in these plants, most of them a type of cardinalide, interfere with the sodium-potassium pump. That's the sodium-potassium ATPase that most of the body cells use to move sodium ions out and potassium ions in. The pump creates an ion imbalance that the cells use in, cell uses in its favor. Nerve cells, for example, transmit signals along their elongated cell bodies, or axons, by opening sodium and potassium gates in a wave that moves down the axon, allowing ions to flow in and out to equilibrate the imbalance. After the wave passes, the sodium pump that we're talking about reestablishes the ionic imbalance. Digitoxin from foxglove and wabane, the main toxin in milkweed, block the pump and present, prevent the cell from establishing the sodium-potassium gradient. This throws the ion concentration in the cell out of whack, causing all sorts of problems. In animals with hearts, like birds and humans, heart cells begin to beat so strongly that the heart fails. The result is death by cardiac arrest. I, I think that's probably not totally correct because I think that arrhythmias uh, supervene first. At least clinically, that's what we have to deal with. Um, scientists have known for decades how these toxins interact with the sodium pump. They bind the part of the pump protein that sticks out through the cell membrane, clogging the channel. So you can't pump sodium uh, in one, one way and potassium the other way, which potassium goes inside the cell, sodium goes out, and it takes ATP to make this thing work. They've even identified two specific amino acid changes or mutations in the protein pump that monarchs and the other insects evolved to prevent the toxin from binding. But Whiteman and his colleagues weren't satisfied with this just-so explanation that insects coincidentally developed the same two identical mutations in the sodium pump 14 separate times, end of story. With the advent of CRISPR-Cas9 gene editing in 2012, co-invented by UC Berkeley's Jennifer Doudna, Whiteman and colleagues Anurag Agarwal of Cornell University and Suzanne Dobler of the University of Hamburg in Germany applied to the Templeton Foundation for a grant to recreate these mutations in fruit, fruit flies and see if they could make these, immune, these flies immune to the toxic effects of cardenolides. Seven years, many failed attempts, and one new grant from the National Institutes of Health later, along with the dedicated CRISPR work of Genetic Vision of Houston, Texas, they finally achieved their goal. In the process, they discovered a third critical compensatory mutation in the sodium pump that had to occur before the last and most potent resistance mutation would stick. Without this compensatory mutation, the maggots died. Their detective work required inserting single, double, and triple mutations into the fruit fly's own sodium pump gene in various orders to assess which ones were necessary. Insects having only one of the two known amino acid changes in the sodium pump gene were best at resisting the plant poisons, but they also had serious side effects, nervous system problems, consistent with the fact that sodium pump mutations in humans are often associated with seizures. However, the third compensatory mutation somehow reduced the negative effects of the other two mutations. One substitution that evolved confers weak resistance, but it is always present and allows for substitutions that are going to confer the most resistance, says postdoctoral fellow Mariana Caragiorgi, a geneticist and evolutionary biologist. This substitution in the insect unlocks the resistance substitutions, reducing the neurological cost of resistance. Because this trait has evolved so many times, we have also shown that this is not random. The fact that one compensatory mutation is required before insects with the most resistant mutation could survive placed a constraint on how insects could evolve toxin resistance, explaining why all 21 lineages converged on the same solution, Whiteman said. In other situations, such as where the protein involved is not so critical to survival, 
animals might find different solutions. This helps answer the question, why does convergence evolve sometimes but not other times, Whiteman said. Maybe the constraints vary. That's a simple answer, but if you think about it, these three mutations turned a Drosophila protein into a monarch one with respect to cardenolide resistance. That's kind of remarkable. The research was funded by the Templeton Foundation and the National Institutes of Health, which you all knew. I've... Um, just to help you out, there's the structure at the top of Wabane, in the middle of digoxin, and in the bottom of digitoxin. If you will, you will look at these. This structure and this structure are identical. This structure is identical. Also, it's just rotated, and in the in life that can rotate. Um, in fact, if you look at these two, uh, you will find this thing is different from that one. But if you're biochemist or even an organic chemist and you rotate that, you will note that these are actually the same structure. And of course, again, in real life, they can rotate. If you look, there's only one difference between the two. Digoxin has a, a hydroxyl group there whereas um, uh, digitoxin only has two hydrogens in the corresponding place. Uh, now, if you look at Wabane, you'll notice that it has a very similar structure. The difference primarily is these hydroxyl groups here and that one hydroxyl group there, and that the, that the structure on the tail end of it, which is... Uh, all of these are kind of, sort of like sugar, but not quite because there should be an extra OH here, there should be an extra OH here if it's glucose or one of the related sugars. Um, and uh, that's true for this one and this one as well. Uh, this one is, uh, has, an ex has a hydroxyl group on this end, but it has the methyl group out here. But instead of sticking forward, out of the paper, as uh, digoxin does, and as digitoxin does, um, it sticks backward uh, when it's arranged in this particular formation. And uh, so both of them have this kind of uh, lactone structure here. They have this sort of uh, sterile structure here. And then they have this modified sugar uh, only, of course, digoxin and digitoxin have quite a bit more of that modified sugar. So they're all related to each other. Um, so does, uh, what does the original article say? Genome editing retraces the evolution of toxin resistance in the monarch butterfly. As for nature, and you'll notice, well... I guess it doesn't say exactly, but it was released on the 2nd of this month. Uh, uh, you can actually, if you know where to look, you can find uh, the article on the internet, but it's kind of um, uh, not legal, and so I'm not going to put it in my uh, talk. Uh, I can get the article legally, so... Um, and you can probably get it at the library if you want to do it legally. Um, identifying the genetic mechanisms of adaptation requires the elucidation of links between the evolution of DNA sequence, phenotype, and fitness. Convergent evolution can be used as a guide to identify candidate mutations that underlie adaptive traits. And new genome editing for technology is facilitating functional validation of these mutations in whole organisms. We combine these approaches to study a classic case of convergence in insects from six orders, including the monarch butterfly, that have independently evolved to colonize plants that produce cardiac glycoside toxins. Many of these insects evolved parallel amino acid substitutions in the alpha subunit, ATP alpha, of the sodium pump, the so, uh, sodium potassium ATPase 
So when they say ATPA, they mean the alpha subunit of that set of protein. Um, the physiologic target of cardiac glycosides. Here we described mutational paths involving three repeatedly changing amino acid sites, 111, 119, and 122 in ATP alpha that are associated with cardiac glycoside specialization. We then performed CRISPR-Cas9 base editing on the native uh, ATP alpha gene in Drosophila melanogaster flies and retrace the mutational path taken across the monarch lineage. We show in vitro, in vivo, in vitro, and in silico. What in the world is in silico? It's in computers. Uh, that the, so remember silico, it must be the uh, word for computer in Latin. Uh, made up word, but we'll take it. <laughs> that the path conferred resistance and target site insensitivity to cardiac glycosides. Yeah, don't use that word in front of uh, uh, Julius Caesar. He'll have no idea what you're talking about. The other two, he will. Um, culminating in triple mutant monarch flies that were as insensitive to cardiac glycosides as monarch butterflies. Monarch flies retained the small amounts of cardiac glycosides through met retained small amounts through metamorphosis, a trait that has been optimized in monarch butterflies to deter predators. You eat me, you die. The order in which the substitutions evolved was explained by amelioration of antagonistic pleiotropy through epistasis. Our study illuminates how the monarch butterfly evolved resistance to a class of plast plant toxins eventually becoming unpalatable and changing the nature of species interactions within ecological communities. Convergently evolved substitutions in ATP alpha have been hypothesized to contribute, as we're beginning the paper itself now. But don't worry, I won't read the whole thing. Um, I have, but I, that's not. Uh, contribute to cardiac glycoside resistance in the monarch butterfly and other specialized insects via target site insensitivity. So when you see TSI, you know what they're talking about, in the sodium pump. However, it is unclear whether the changes are sufficient for resistance in whole organisms or are molecular spandrels. Is that just a lucky break or does that actually help the organism cope with wobbing? Candidate adaptive alleles that do not confer a fitness advantage when tested more rigorously. They thought it did, but really it didn't help. In addition, the evolutionary order of substitutions suggests a constrained adaptive walk. You have to go one mutation at a time. But an in vivo genetic dissection has not been conducted, so it is not possible to draw conclusions about the adaptive role of these substitutions. So they're going to remedy that. We have identified a core set of amino acid substitutions in cardiac glycoside specialized insects that define potential mutational paths to resistance and TSI, target site insensitivity. In that setting, resistance and TSI are roughly synonymous. We focused on the first extracellular loop H1 to H2 of uh, ATP alpha, where most candidate TSI conferring substitutions occur. We used maximum likelihood to reconstruct ancestral states for cardiac glycoside specialization, feeding and sequestering, and amino acids within the H1 to H2 loop of ATP alpha across the species phylogeny. And uh, they have more to say about that in supplementary material. Sites 111 and 122 underwent frequent parallel substitutions associated with specialization. In addition, sites 119 re experienced repeated substitutions in specialized intact and co-evolved with site 111. However, substitutions at site 119 were not associated with specialization, that is, if they're by themselves, because they also occurred in non-specialized insects. To determine whether substitutions at site 111 or 122 appeared in an ordered fashion relative to substitution at site 119, we compared the mutational order in 21 specialized lineages, that's different animals that, or insects, uh, whatever, that can resist wabane and therefore can eat milkweed, 
uh, we compared the mutational order to in those lineages to a random permutation null mode, a null model, and found that the ordering was highly unlikely to have occurred by chance, as you always got one mutation, then the other, then the other. Uh, a replacement at site 119 always occurred before or with a replacement at site 122. If you don't have 119, 122 is too damaging. And repeated substitutions at the three sites evolved concurrently with specialization. We focused on the mutational path taken by the, and again, I'm skipping through some of this. If you see dots, that means we're, we're eliminating stuff. We focused on the mutational path taken by the modern monarch lineage, which includes species that do not feed on cardiac glycoside producing plants and those that sequester the toxin. We use CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing coupled with homology-directed repair to generate viable homozygous ATP alpha knock-in. You can't call them knock-out because we're actually changing stuff and making it better, we think. Uh, Drosophila lines carrying the precise substitutions at sites 111, 119, and 122 of four consecutive ATP alpha genomes in the monarch lineage, LAN, LSN, uh, VSN and VSH, and you're going, what in the world are those? Well, the substitutions could be going from Q, which is glutamine, to uh, lysine, uh, pardon me, not lysine, leucine in 111. So that, that means that LAN is one. Uh, then A, 119, that's alanine, can go to serine, um, uh, and that gives you the LSN from the LAN. And then the VSN can, you see the L going to V uh, at 111, and N122H, and you're going, what in the world? What's that? Well, see, VSN goes to VSH. And why doesn't it go straight? Well, we'll talk about that in just a minute, um, respectively. Uh, we also generated control lines in the same genetic backgrounds and viable homozygous lines carrying the key single substitution A119S, QSN, and N122H, QAH. So QAH would be almost original. It would be Q over here, A over here, and N going to H there. So they tried making those uh, fruit flies as well, which evolved along the monarch line mutational path, but not alone. Now let's uh, take a look at that. First of all, if you're going from Q, excuse me, to L, it only takes one mutation of one base. You have to take this A and turn it into a U, and all of a sudden you've got leucine instead of uh, glutamine. Okay, now the next one was, let's see, the next one was uh, A going to S, A119 going to S, and A is alanine. There's alanine, and it goes to S, which is serine, and again, you need one mutation to do that. You just have to change the first G into a U. You do that, you've got the mutation done. Now, uh, L going to V, and see, somebody's going to say, well, why don't you just go straight from Q to V? But to see, in order to do Q to V, you have to change two of them, whereas you can change it from Q to L, and then change it from L to V with one mutation each time. And finally, the N122 going to H, um, N is asparagine, 
and going to histidine, again, it takes only one mutation. You have to take the first A and turn it into a C, and then you've got it. Okay, and um, what does that look like in the enzyme itself? Well, they have a drawing of the first part of the ATP pump. I don't think it's the whole thing, but it's... And here is where Wabane normally sits, right in this little cleft here. And that's where it jams up the works. And this is the cue that gets trained, changed to leucine and then to valine. It's a polar thing and apparently you know, it's helpful for the wabane to stick to. But if you change that to leucine or valine, then the wabane doesn't stick as well. The same way with this uh, N, asparagine, um, which translates to, what's it? Um, uh, it goes to histidine, and again, it no longer sticks as well as it should to, well, as long as the plant hopes it does, to, uh, uh, to the wabane, and so again, it doesn't fit. And along the way, it helps if this alanine here is changed to a serine, which has a hydroxyl group on it. So that's, uh, that's how the thing actually works. Now, skipping over a bunch, at the physiological level, sodium pump enzymatic assays using head extracts from knock-in fly lines showed that each sequential monarch lineage genotype has a neutral to positive effect on TSI, that's uh, target site insensitivity to Wabane. Um, LAN provided a small increase in target sensitivity, insensitivity, while the next genome genotype to evolve, LSN and VSN, increase TSI by about 10 times, and they've quantified this. Um, remarkably, TSI rose about 1,000 times in mutant flies carrying VSH, the monarch butterfly genotype. So you really do it if you can make that final switch. Monarch fly sodium pumps were, all, were as insensitive to Wabane as those of monarch butterflies. They're as good as the monarch. Since site 119 co-evolves with site 111, and substitutions at site 119, goof on my part, always occurred before or with TSI conferring substitutions at site 122. Skipping over a little bit, finally, the binding affinity of Wabine to NAK um, ATPase is high for QSN and low for QAH according to docking score, scores. So, you do it partially, it doesn't help much, it helps a little bit. N122H conferred the highest TSI of any substitution, yet appeared last in the adaptive walk, and was contingent on a substitution at site 119, which suggests that N122H imposes high fitness costs that are mitigated by A119S. To investigate this, we phenotype monarch lineages, uh, lineage knock-in flies, for neurological seizures upon shaking, bang sensitivity, a common phenotype in hypomorphic uh, sodium potassium ATPase mutants. Bang sensitivity varied widely within among and among knock-in fly lines. This variation could be due to in the intentionally introduced mutation or to unidentified epimutations that arose from base editing and resulted in cryptic decanalization effects of the function on the function of the nervous system. Despite this uncertainty, QSN flies were the least bang sensitive and QAH flies were the most, QSN is the, the, uh, uh, the, the, well it goes, it's the alanine only. Um, Although mutational pathways to adaptive peaks have been identified in microorganisms, this is, to our knowledge, the first in vivo validation of a multi-step adapt adaptive walk in a multicellular organism and illustrates how complex organismal traits can evolve by following simple rules. And then there's references and there's methods and we're going to leave those out for now. Now, what do I do with all this stuff? Well, notice that there are three-point mutations that gradually improve the ability of monarchs to eat milkweed. 
This is an adaptive path where each ad adaptation is advantageous, precisely where a Darwinian step-by-step -step mechanism will help. I think this is, in fact, evolution. Notice that by our previous definition, these mutations are devolution. Here is another illustration of Michael Behe's first rule of adaptive evolution. Break whatever you need to in order to make it work. The monarch has not created a new protein to deal with in Wabane. It has simply adapted the target protein for Wabane so that the poison no longer fits, or perhaps fits and no longer jams things up. At some cost to the monarch, it's more sensitive to being shaken, but at a cost well worth living with for that benefit. Now we see the same effect in antibiotic resistance. It is rare to get a special new enzyme. It does happen penicillinase, and usually that, by the way, is imported whole into the organism, not developed by the organism itself. Um, how did it happen originally? Nobody knows. And much more common to modify the target of the toxin, that, for example, tetracycline and genomycin resistance. Um, the resulting germs do not grow as well in the wild and are outcompeted by the wild type in the absence of the antibiotic. And one way to get rid of MRSA is simply to stop using antibiotics and it no longer has an advantage. Well, of course, that means that some people die in the meantime, so we better find something else to deal with that. But I can remember, for example, Septra working on organisms and then not working and then they quit using it, and pretty soon the organisms are sensitive again. And if we start using it for everything, pretty soon they'll be resistant again, and we'll have to give them a little space. Incidentally, the monarch butterfly is becoming endangered due to decreasing supplies of milkweed. Why is that? Well, Roundup is part of the problem. Roundup kills milkweed. And monarchs don't have enough milkweed, and so the population is decreasing. So this adaptation, although it's good if you've got lots of milkweed to eat, if you don't have milkweed, it's actually a bad adaptation. They don't do so well as the regular butterflies. Michael Behe could not ask for more timely confirmation of the thesis of his book. When one adds genetic entropy to his observation, evolution becomes completely impotent to produce the stunning appearance of design we see in nature. Contrary to Dawkins' confident assertions, evolution cannot completely account for the variety of life that exists. Darwinists will have to go back to being intellectually unfulfilled. At least, that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Yes, comment. You may, you may have covered this, but uh, my question is basically, did they, with CRISPR-Cas9, do all three amino acid changes at once? Which, no. Which would be a trivial use. You could just uh, change three as one. Uh, it's too hard to do it all at once. It's easier to make one change because the, the CRISPR makes one specific change, grow the organism, and then the next generation, or maybe yeah, several generations CRISPR, later, do CRISPR another can CRISPR. can change 20 amino acids at once. Well, yeah, but see... You're talking about residue, uh, residue 111, and then 119, and then 120. Well, and that's actually triplet. My, my question is basically, is there something about the changes following one mutation in the, and the fruit fly survival that is necessary before the next mutation comes along? and uh, adds to it. Well, they were able to grow flies with one mutation. Yeah, well, uh, my, my take on what, what they did, and I read this before the discussion here, was 
that they wanted to trace the evolutionary path, which would obviously be one at a time. Right. My, uh, my second Could they question have done is, all three at did once? They, did they, why did they not try all three at once? Well, probably because it was easier to be sure you had exactly what you wanted. If you do one and then do it on the progeny sure. and then do it on the progeny, at least that would be my guess. Um, now, whether they could do it all three at once, maybe they could. Um, well, there, there's nothing maybe about they the want there's nothing to. about the CRISPR process that would make changing three amino acids more difficult than changing one. That would be a technical question, and I think it's just a matter of uh, what yeah, do you okay. want to do. I, I'm just interested in, in the underlying logic. I was wondering maybe if doing this, again, doing this all at once would I don't would think, create a ph phenotypic change that wouldn't work as compared to it developing uh, I would not think so. I can't think of any reason. No, and it would just be a matter of the technical challenge of doing it, I think, would be the only real challenge there. And and you could do it, and, and I mean, you could say, well, yeah, I want I want all, actually, before changes, because you have to, one of them requires two. The, the other question I have is, uh, can we look for evolutionary change at this level? in which monarchs begin to choose other plant sources that they don't have to adapt to. There's plenty of them there. So why should they die out with milkweed becoming less common? Well, there would be two things, okay? One of them is, uh, could you mutate back? I would think so. And you'd probably have to do it stepwise if you, if you don't have people in laboratories with CRISPR to help you. Sure. Um, that's called intelligent design, by the way. <laughs> Should we say hopefully intelligent design? <laughs> yes. Uh, that's all I have. Yeah. Uh, no, it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating... Fascinating problem. The thing of it is, this is one where one mutation helps a little, another mutation helps more, another mutation helps more, and then the final mutation really helps. And that is precisely the kind of pathway for which Darwinism is set up. Yes, precisely. And in fact, what Darwinism actually should be arguing is that between all life forms, there are life, life forms that can change with one or two or three or whatever, you know, uh, amino, ac uh, amino acids and therefore DNA changes that allow you to go all the way from amoeba or actually more precisely archaea probably to humans and and uh, sequoia trees and whatever else. That basically that's the requirement because that small change is something that could happen in reasonable evolutionary time. And and if each one is advantageous, then you can grow more of this one and then grow more of this one and then grow more of this one. That is an evolutionary pathway. And in fact that's their point in, in right. demonstrating. But you see, in order to make this work for all of life, you have to assert that there is an evolutionary pathway of that kind between every single set of organisms. And I don't, they haven't gotten anywhere close to proving that. In fact, there appear to be huge gaps in biochemistry, and there appear to be huge gaps in the fossil record where you, between point A and point B, there are vast deserts with nothing in them. It's a little bit like saying, you know, I can walk from here to San Francisco, 
I can get to San Francisco and I can find a little yes. bridge and then I can go to Tokyo by just doing the same process. Well, there's ocean in the way. But they're the Hawaiian Islands. Well, yeah, you cut down, what, 1% of the ocean? Where's the rest of them? Well, there's Guam. I mean, you know, at a certain point, we're having a problem here. Yeah, they, uh, they, they avoid the probability argument, which is still central in all well, of this. Notice that Dawkins recognizes that the probability argument is a valid one. But he successfully disguises that recognition in all of his writings so that people who are less informed will believe him because he writes so well. Well, he in, in, in the book, in the introduction before you get to page one, it actually talks about he is an advocate. That means he's not really a scientist, he's a lawyer. Uh, very interesting. Uh, he's that the that the scientific world has recognized him so fully when he just ignores the huge gaps that he has to cover, and they they follow him. Yeah. Well, see, the thing of it is, and he says this up front, so it's helpful to understand this. If you don't have God, there's nothing else on the market. So it's got to work. Yes, uh, but. <laughs> yes, go ahead. Around 1973, 1974, the researchers at UCLA published uh, the very first uh, book uh, in the literature, or I guess it's the article in the literature, outlining the sodium, potassium, and sodium calcium pumps. It's a very interesting article. And then second on digoxin, the uh, arrhythmia very likely as the uh, digoxin level increases in the cell, it uh, can increase the risk of uh, ventricular fibrillation, and that's probably the arrhythmia that they're noticing in those uh, uh, organisms, little insects, when uh, they go into an arrhythmia from uh, excess digoxin or digitalis products. Well, they apparently have problems with the nervous system because they don't have an actual heart no. of the kind that we have. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, Although I don't know, if it do, are insects' hearts required to beat from one end to the other? If it, they are, then that might cause a problem too. There's mm -hmm. substantial variation in insects. Yeah. What the heart is. Uh, it can be a very long tube beating, or it can be a much more discreet structure, like it is interesting in, in decapods. Crabs and lobsters have a, yeah. a much more discreet mm -hmm. Um, yeah, but uh, they do have that. something that pumps endolymph around. So, mm -hmm. yeah. But uh, they probably don't have as much of a problem. If, if, if our heart goes, we go pretty fast. Um, if the, their heart goes, I don't know how long it takes for them to, you know, maybe if you recover in five minutes, you're good. Well, let me just comment uh, this. Uh, if For those who don't really... Uh, haven't dug into the reasons why neurons and muscles have to fire and do fire before things happen uh, is totally dependent on the sodium potassium pump because there is no gradient for electrical activity if the pump isn't functioning. Everything's at equilibrium. Yeah. And, but incidentally, another definition of equilibrium is dead. Yeah. Well, one of the things that we do you know, in medicine is we carefully titrate it. So it's this bad, but not this bad, which is why we use digoxin pills instead of giving people foxglove powdered, um, because how much is in it? And if you think about it, you know, this gives us an idea. If you're out in the country, I'm gonna give MacGyver some ideas. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and you're out of your uh, any of you're out of your digoxin. If you just take a bunch of milkweed and eat it, you should be okay. Now, don't ask me how much milkweed, 
or which varieties have the most, because I don't know. It would, that would be totally experimental, totally. But you know, if if you're doing a movie, why it'll always come out okay. So we're good. We're good. <laughs> I share your cynicism. <laughs> The, the, what they discovered in, in uh, England is that the very low dose of digoxin actually improves the contractility of the heart. And at the higher doses of digoxin, that is then, that improvement is lost so that those individuals, the herbalist in England who were preparing the foxglove uh, tea, were very likely utilizing that very low level of digoxin, which was being used to treat individuals who at that time, you know, what we now call congestive heart failure, at that time they called it dropsy, you know, whereas uh, now we call it congestive heart failure, was actually helping those individuals because it was using the low level digoxin effect, which improves the contractility of the myocardial muscle. Well, well, I'm old enough, and I think you're probably old enough to remember when Digoxin was one of the things you had to know about because it was used for congestive heart failure, because it was one of our best things. And it's still used in some places uh, to slow down uh, atrial fibrillation. So, I I mean, uh, this is actually relevant to medicine. Uh, But it's just fascinating to look at this and realize that this is how the plants poison the insects, and this is how the monarch butterfly get around that, and therefore had its own feeding grounds that nobody else would touch. Well, almost nobody, because there were a few beetles and whatnot that did the same thing. And now there's a fruit fly that if it ever gets out is gonna destroy the milkweed crop. And, 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 and it is a, you know, it is an adaptive thing, and, and, the, and the monarchs flourish, but they are totally dependent on milkweed. And if milkweed goes down, the monarchs go down with it. They don't have the ability to easily adapt back. It's, once you go there, it's kind of a, almost a one-way street because now you have to back off in stages that are adaptive in each case, and that makes it harder and harder to do. There are actually pre-milkweed monarchs or relatives of monarchs that, that, uh, that are part of this. Uh, yes? From my uh, limited knowledge, the monarch will disappear uh, if milkweed does. Pretty much that's true. Why didn't it disappear before milkweed? Because they weren't actually monarchs. They were monarch Different species. They were monarch-like butterflies. Probably didn't look that much different, but they were able to live on everything. And then they 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 developed the genetic ability to handle the poison that was in the milkweed. They had to develop it pretty quickly then, otherwise they're goners. According to these people, it's 13,000 years. According to some people, it might have been uh, 4,000 or something years. Is milkweed poisonous to humans? Yes. When I was a camp counselor- But if you eat just a little bit of it, your heart will beat better. When I was a camp counselor in Illinois, and we um, taught the kids about edible wild plants, we fed them milkweed. Really? Nobody got sick. Nothing happened. Interesting. I suppose it depends on where you are, how much wabine is in it, and whether humans can get rid of it faster than some other uh, creatures. Well, the human kids didn't like the idea. They didn't want to eat wild plants. That, uh, you're right, the, uh, but that's a fascinating thing, um, that, that milkweed was considered non-toxic enough to eat in a pinch. They probably didn't like the taste, though. 
Well, they were supposed to be learning about edible, uh, learning about edible plants, and um, the idea of eating weeds was not appealing. So, <laughs> well, that I understand. Nobody likes eating dandelions, but they're actually supposed yeah. to be pretty good. Oh, I don't know. Then this probably doesn't contribute much to the conversation. But doesn't um, oleanders don't they also have digitalis? They have. A, I'm not sure if they have digitalis, but they have one of uh, one of the relatives of it. Yes, uh, they may actually have digoxin or digitoxin, um, but oleanders. Yes, there's another idea for our for our uh, MacGyver. <laughs> Well, I guess at this point I will say it's been fun. Um, next week, uh, Ariel Roth will have the chair, and he's going to talk about the Capitan Reef. And uh, uh, you're going to get to see probably as much as you'll see from anybody. So come back next week.